This lecture is going to introduce you to the current state of the art, if you like, in the mind-body problem. There's going to be four parts, and the first part will be a general overview, and then we'll delve into some more. Uh, don't expect any solutions to the mind-body problem today, or may maybe in the next thousand years or so. The mind-body problem is a very old one, as old as people's thinking about the mind and the brain, uh, and it's thousands of years old. So there's, there's no obvious solution to the problem. Um, but we're going to go through the main current positions, some arguments, and some counter-arguments. And the way we're going to do that, in the first part of the lecture, we're going to have a quick recap of what we've come across before, and then an overview of the different approaches to the mind-body problem. In the second part, we're going to look at modern versions of dualism. That's the idea that there's two kinds of things in the universe mind and not mind, mind and matter if you like, and that those things can't really be separated finally. In the third part we'll look at modern versions of monism or materialism or physicalism, and this is the idea that there's really only one sort of stuff in the universe and it produces both mind and material. And in the last part I'm just going to offer a sort of a bit of a reflection, my own personal reflection on, on this whole thing. So the learning objectives for this session are to identify the different modern accounts of the relationship between the mind and the brain, that is the mind-body problem, so modern approaches to the mind-body problem, and second, to understand the main arguments for and against each account. And you could read a week's worth of books and papers on, on each topic and still only have scratched the surface of what different people think. So this is really not about trying to do an entire philosophy degree on each on each. Um, on each argument. It's really more about understanding what are the main arguments that might be relevant to psychology and might be relevant to the mind-brain problem in modern neuroscience. So first, a recap. In psychological literature on the history of neuroscience and psychology in the brain, Descartes is identified as the person who started off this problem back in the 1600s. And his approach to the problem was to say that there are two kinds of things, two kinds of stuff in the universe. There's the physical stuff and the mental stuff. And these were separate, but they sort of interact. And the idea that there are two kinds of substances has been called substance dualism. And the problem of their interaction has not really been solved. Um, Descartes' solution was to say that the pineal gland, which is that glowing thing in the brain picture at the top of the screen, that that was the source of the interaction between the mind and the, and the brain. Uh, and the only reason he picked it, I think, was because it's, there's only one of them if you look at in detailed brain anatomy, most things have two sides in the brain, but, but the pineal gland, he thought, only had one side. So he thought, well, that must be it. And that's it, really. That's the only reason to think that the pineal gland was the, the location via which the, the mind communicated with the, the brain and vice versa. And they, they don't. They don't do that. So the problem of the interaction between the mind and brain, despite being 400 years old, has not been solved. So we really just take Descartes as a starting point of, of how to think about the mind and brain in modern neuroscience and psychology. An, an idea that's come up a couple of times in this lecture series is a parallelism. And this is not quite an interaction between mind and brain. It's rather the idea that, that mind and brain sort of live these relatively separate parallel lives. So that things that happen in the mind stay in the mind and things that happen in the body stay in the body. And this was an idea of Leibniz and, and Alexander Bain. But it's not, not been a very popular one because it sort of discounts the possibility that your mind could have any effect over your brain, over your body and any causal relationship. So this really didn't um, go down well with, with people who thought that, in fact, there's this feeling that you do have control over your body in some sense. So that the mind does have causal interactions with the body. So parallelism didn't really seem to fit with people's view of how the mind worked. So if, if you don't really think that there are different substances, mind and body, and you don't really think that they can in interact, then you've you only got a few choices, really. You've either got to accept that mind and body do not interact, and that was the, the view of Leibniz and the, the parallelism, or you could accept that mind and body are not separate substances, we're going to look at that. Uh, maybe they're different properties. Maybe they're only a single sort of substance. Or a third possibility is that somehow you sort of explain away this problem. Maybe we're all just 
confused about the mind-body problem. Maybe it's not a problem at all. And we're not really going to talk much about number one here, because I think most scientists and researchers will probably reject this sort of idea of parallelism. So the rest of the lecture then is going to be about options two and three. How can we deal with the situation that the mind and the body aren't really separate substances, that there is some sort of interaction? Or can we maybe explain away the problem of the mind-body interaction? So I spent a happy morning last week uh, scraping through Wikipedia and other sources of information to try and put it, to get it clear in my own mind uh, what, what are the different views of the philosophy of mind. Um, so take a deep breath. Um, <clears throat> let me try and explain what I've called here the mind-body spectrum. So on the, on the top left, you've got dualism, and that's the belief that there are two kinds of things in the, in the universe, mind things and, and body things. And on the top right, in blue, you've got the idea that there's really only one kind of thing, and it's all mind and body are just sort of the same sort of stuff. Then the rest of the uh, many boxes, I think there are 14 boxes in this image, the rest of these 14 boxes are either slightly bluish or slightly reddish. And the slightly reddish ones are different versions of the dualism argument, and the slightly bluish ones are different versions of the monism argument. So let's go for the middle row now, from the oranges on the left to the uh, nice dark blues on the right. So the orange box is the idea that the substance dualism, there are two kinds of things and they interact. And there's a, the dates that these, this idea was quite popular, so 1600s to 1900s. And there's a few authors identified there, Descartes, um, as well as some modern authors, Popper and Eccles. Then all the way to the right, you've got idealism. That's in the dark blue. And that's the idea that, in fact, everything is mental. There's no, there's no two kinds of stuff because everything is just mental. So the entire foundation of the universe is sort of an illusion in your own mind. And, and there is no reality beyond your, your own perceptions. So those are the extremes then of the dualism. So there are two kinds of different stuff and they, they interact. On one end, the substance dualism, and on the far right end, we've got idealism, where everything is mind and there's no matter at all, and it's all a big illusion. And everything in between those two, so the sort of orangey, yellowy colours through to the, the lighter blues and the greeny blues, they're really sort of compromised positions already. So if you think of substance dualism on the far left and idealism on the far right, then everything in the middle is already sort of an interaction or a, a compromise or a, a trade-off between the two extreme positions. And the two that we're going to talk a lot more about are in the middle of this plot. So the yellow, which is a kind of property dualism, and then the teal colour, which is a the physicalist or materialist views of the mind. And so I want you just to get from this graph, this image, that we're, we're already sort of in the middle of this space. We're not talking about the extreme positions of substance dualism or idealism. We're actually already talking about things, positions which have already been narrowed down to be sort of taking the best parts of both dualist and mon monist beliefs. So in the yellow box is forms of property dualism. And this is the idea that there may not be two kinds of separate stuff in the universe, but property dualists would say that mind is definitely a different thing than, than matter. It's a different property of physical things, and it can't be reduced to matter alone. So by re reduce or reduction, I mean you can't explain away the mind using different concepts. And we'll get, we'll get into a lot more of this as the lecture goes on. But the idea of property dualism in, really is you can't reduce mind to the brain. However much neuroscience progresses, you'll never really be able to explain away mental states. There'll always be something special and different about mental states. And that's the property dualism, and that's the yellowy, greeny colours on the left of the bottom row. Now, the second general approach we're going to look at is the physicalist approach. Is that's the teal in the middle on the right. That's the idea that everything is really physical, and this is the same as materialism, and it's a form of monism. And physicalist or materialist views tend to say that although mind may be really convincing to us and it may be it may seem very real, that in fact mind and matter are just the same thing. And either we're a bit confused about it, as maybe the eliminatives or the behaviorists might say, 
or maybe it's just difficult for us to to realize that that mind is actually the same thing as as matter and so all of the physicalist views there that the bluey bluey colors on the bottom right they're basically saying that we can explain the mind in terms of lower level things like the brain or behavior or phys purely physical interactions and we're going to go back to many of these positions throughout the um, throughout the lecture so I just wanted to give you a heads up of all of the different positions that we're going to cover I'm going to try and use the same colors so whenever you see blues it's going to be sort of monist physicalists and whenever you see oranges or yellows or greens it's going to be slightly more dualist positions but there is a very sort of mixed murky area of, of differences between these positions and it's it's often not clear which philosopher sits exactly in which box and these are all again looking backwards over the over the history of the, the topic you try and put people into boxes uh, and they, they probably wouldn't have put themselves in these boxes exactly so you'll see the same philosopher might appear in multiple boxes some people just disagree with everything and it can get a bit confusing so this is my this spectrum here is my version of what I how I feel the the different positions fit together and each of these individual psychologists uh, sorry each of these individual philosophers might might completely disagree with me so there we go so just to outline what the rest of the lecture is going to look like this is the the mind body spectrum again so I've just taken the top row the top two rows of um, the previous image and I've put them in a, a line for you so at the top we've got dualisms the red ones and the bottom we've got monisms the blue ones um, you already talked about substance dualism Descartes and a bit of parallelism in previous lectures and at the bottom we've also we've already talked a bit about idealism and Kant's view that all experience is sort of filtered or structured by the mind um, we've already talked a little bit about uh, William James in previous lectures so we're not going to talk about those four chaps thoughts so we're not going to talk about Descartes, Leibniz, Kant or James in this section what we are going to focus on are those two things in the middle property dualism the yellowy ones and physicalism or materialism the sort of teal colored ones so that's where we're going to go so we're now going to if you just um, focus on these two in the center we're now going to look at property dualism and physicalism so within what I've called property dualisms we've got three positions to look at one is called epiphenomenalism and the person I've chosen to represent that view is Thomas Huxley who you may remember from my last lecture who, uh, who was, has been described as Darwin's bulldog so as well as promoting Charles Darwin's ideas about evolution he also had some ideas of his own about philosophy of mind the second property dualism we're going to talk about is panpsychism and this is an interesting idea from Thomas Nagel there and others in which they believe that everything in the universe has a little bit of mental states about it so pan meaning everything just like pandemic pan means you know a large everyone has it's a large thing psychism everyone has a bit of mind everything has a bit of mind in it and this is an interesting idea and it's quite, actually quite hard to reject even Chalmers at the bottom there he, he doesn't reject panpsychism and the third kind of property dualism is associated a little bit with Chalmers although I, I couldn't really pin this down exactly I haven't read his very big book yet but this is what I've chosen to call emergent materialism it's also called non-reductive materialism or non-reductive physicalism and this is definitely quite a compromised position Chalmers view is that there's definitely a material basis to mind but you still can't explain mental phenomena using purely physical means so those are our property dualisms that we're going to talk about three of them and as I said before probably each of these thinkers wouldn't have liked being called a property dualist but I'm calling them property dualists just for the sake of getting it clear in my own head and hopefully yours and the second group of theories we're going to look at is modern versions of monism and I'm calling these physicalisms or materialisms and there's four that I want you to be familiar with now you've already dealt with behaviorism and philosophical behaviorism in the previous lecture or two uh, so we're not going to look at that again but you can associate that position with Gilbert Ryle the English chap 
Uh, also Ludwig Wittgenstein has been associated with that. So we're not talking about behaviorism at the bottom there. The three the other positions that we are going to talk about, I'm calling them identity theory, that's associated with Mr. Place, functionalism, that's Mr. Putnam, and then eliminative materialism, and that's associated with the Churchlands. Now I'm giving you the image there of Patricia Churchland, I think she's probably the main proponent of this particular view, but she's married to Paul Churchland, and together they've they've obviously influenced each other, so they're often cited together. A um, little bit sexist, I think. So you might see reference to the Churchlands, um, but I'm going to be showing you just a picture of a uh, Patricia Churchland there, because I think she's probably the more influential philosopher of the two. Uh, when, when putting together this, uh, these set of slides, I realised that almost all of the philosophers that are associated with psychology and experimental psychology and the mind-brain problem, they're almost entirely um, English-speaking philosophers. So they come from England or United States or Australia or, or Canada. So we shouldn't neglect, in light of our discussions last week about or last, in my last lecture about um, sort of cultural biases in modern psychology, we shouldn't forget that there's whole schools of philosophy that, that don't speak English, or rather that aren't, um, that aren't in English-speaking countries. So there's continental philosophy, it's sometimes sort of, sometimes disparagingly called, I think. Um, that's, there's French philosophy and German philosophy and some, some Danish there, Kierkegaard. Uh, so there's lots of other schools of thought who discuss the mind-body problem and consciousness. I'm just going to name a few. Existentialism, that's associated with Sartre. Um, phenomenology, I believe that's Heidegger. Um, structuralism, uh, I'm not sure who that's associated with. Psychoanalytic theory, so again starting from Freud, but many other developments of psychoanalytic theory. Critical theory, and many more besides. And so just be aware that when we're focusing on the largely Anglo-Saxon, English-speaking philosophers on philosophy of mind. Just be aware that there's an awful lot of other people who think about the mind-body problem. So to prepare you then for the last, the next two parts, we're going to look at six positions on the mind-body problem. Three of these are going to be dualist positions. Three of them are going to be monist positions. And for each of these six positions, I'm going to give you one name of a person or philosopher who thinks that sort of thing. Uh, one slide description of the position, one slide of arguments for the position or sort of further explanations of the position and why they hold it, and then one slide of arguments against. So we're going to follow a very strict structure for the next, um, the next two sections. And I'm hoping that this structure and the repeating themes and the repeating colours and the repeating, repeating people are going to help you integrate all this um, quite different and difficult material. So remember that as you go along, um, do write down questions as you're thinking about this stuff and do post them on the, the Q&A site on Moodle and we'll, we'll deal with all these difficult topics in the Q&A next week.